Kelly and Parsons farewell.
Are you needing me to play one more? Is the Am I oh Hi, Kim. Hi. Yeah. Oh, okay. We're having some microphone problems. Um, yeah. I, I uh, need you hear me. Uh, we, we, the sound has been coming through wonderfully uh, here over here in oh. Chapman. Uh, thank you again so much for, as always, for a wonderful I show. I wish you a happy Mother's Day. I, you know, um, to all you mothers out there, welcome, happy, to, happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's <laughs> From Day. Kim and everybody else here. <laughs> Well, thanks again, Kim. Thank you. Well, they're having me. Um, and everyone, thank you all very much for being here. Um, welcome to the May edition of the meeting for Orange County Astronomers. And um, it looks like Kyle Graham, who is doing our announcements, is getting into position. So uh, without more ado, I will turn it over to Kyle. Great. Thank you. All right, uh, here we go. So welcome new members. Uh, you'll be able to find your name badges on the whiteboard there at Chapman, or if you're not present, uh, they'll eventually be mailed to you. Star parties, there are ANSYS star party dates, which are May 20th and June 17th. Uh, Astrophysics Special Interest Group will be meeting May 19th at the Heritage Museum, 7.30 p.m. Uh, more on the beginner's class in a minute. And then the next OCA board meeting will be July 30th, so that's a ways from now. Uh, remember to check the uh, online calendar for all updates and information. So as I mentioned, the beginner's class, uh, there will be one at the Heritage Museum. July 7th at 7.30 p.m. Uh, if you have a telescope, don't really know how to use it, uh, come to the class and there will be people there to help you learn how to use your telescope and kind of get you up and running on it so that you can observe. Uh, some upcoming events, uh, actually both of these uh, feature Professor James Bullock from UCI. Um, this first one is the Optical Society of Southern California's next meeting, uh, Wednesday, May 17th. Registration is required. Uh, there's a reception, dinner, uh, some awards, and then the presentation. You can see some ticketing information here. And then uh, the events at UCI. Um, these slides are posted so you can get this information from the website. Uh, later on. You don't need to frantically jot it down now. Um, another event, uh, we'll make sure this gets up as well. The uh, Another event, UCI, it's uh, at the Cove. There's the address. This is the lunchtime event on Tuesday, May 16th. So that's the day before. Um, and you'll hear from Professor Bullock as well at that event. Uh, you can see ticket information there. Uh, Doug, do you want to speak about OVRO? Yeah, thank you. Uh, we're going to be at Owens Valley Radio Observatory on the weekend of the 24th of June. And uh, what's special this year is that we get a, a, an overview of the DSA telescopes. And uh, those are survey telescopes that are radio telescopes. The DSA 110 is at, at the OVRO site in a pinwheel. And uh, uh, it's one of the larger... Uh, lower frequency radio telescopes, but they're building one out 100 miles east of Tonopah that's 2,000 dishes over 20 miles on a side area. And we're going to have a tour of that in the next couple of years. But it's going to be a little weird because the low frequency nature of it, you can't use your cell phone. You can't use Bluetooth. There's no restaurants. There's no bathrooms. There's nothing. They have to build all the infrastructure. So I'm going to make sure we have at least water and and bathrooms when we go there. But it'll be a basically a uh, a grand view type of experience, dry camp for a weekend. But we get to see what's going to be the largest radio telescope in the world, and it's in our backyard. The DSA 100 is not quite that big, but it'll do the same thing. And the technological improvements 
between the old telescopes and the new ones is really remarkable. So we'll learn quite a lot when you go up there. We'll get a chance to crawl over the 40-meter dish, see a few other things in the hobnob, and see some astronomy that night, both nights, Friday and Saturday. Look forward to seeing you there. Just let me know. There's some information in the series Astronomer, or you can contact me and uh, um, tell me what you want to know. Awesome. Thank you, Doug. Uh, continuing on, uh, Jeff Gray is the Outreach Events Coordinator. If you wish to contact him, you can contact him at uh, the email below. The coffee stand is up and available for those who are in person. Uh, coffee, donuts, water, the usual stuff is available. Feel free to purchase at any time throughout the meeting. Uh, the Adopt Scope program is up and running. Uh, you can grab more information on the website. Here's a picture of how to get to the uh, information about the program. You can look at a uh, sample adoption agreement. You can look at current inventory. All those things are right there for you. Uh, Serious Astronomer Newsletter. Um, if you have anything uh, that you think would be interesting, to put in the newsletter, please email those items of interest to Dave Fisher at the email there, and he will review those. Newsletter uh, delivery preference. Just a reminder, everyone always gets the newsletter printed, uh, a print copy mailed to their home. However, if you would like to stop receiving a mailed copy and opt out of that, uh, please email Charlie. Uh, all members always have electronic access to the newsletter through the OC Astronomers website, and that does not change whether you get the print copy or not. Uh, ANSA site, please remember to keep weeds clear uh, from your pad and help with all the common areas such as the ANSA house, football field, uh, observatory, etc. The next general meeting will be June 9th, and I'm going to turn it over now to our What's Up speaker, John Garrett from the Temecula Valley Astronomers. Thank you. Hey, it looks like we're uh, in business. Well, well, thank you for uh, in. Oh, we're just a moment. We're, we're good. We're ready. Oh, okay. Um, well, thank you for having me out here to share uh, my photos and observations. And um, so I'm going to cover a few things that you might see if you get out to a dark location uh, this month. I hope all of you do. The uh, a couple of days ago was the first clear night I had, so I was able to identify Venus in the evening sky. So here's a photo from my backyard looking toward the west, and I hope you can see Venus up there. But um, the, uh, I can't see, anyway, the um, uh, Venus is high in, in the western sky, and it's going to be rising higher, so we're going to have Venus for a while with us. And if you look at Venus through a pair of binoculars, you might see something comparable to this. This is a photo I took with my three inch telescope. And when I have it at a focal length of F5, its images are about comparable to a pair, like a 10 power pair of binoculars. And so you might see something like this, but if you're also looking through binoculars, you might see something like this. And this is my, my joke about Hollywood's binoculars. Every time Hollywood wants you to know you're looking through binoculars, they make this figure eight for you. And um, if you actually, if your binoculars actually are giving a figure eight shape, uh, you're probably seeing two images. So this is what you might expect to see uh, in a pair of binoculars if they're like this. But uh, back to what you might see in a telescope, if you brought up the power to around 100 power or so, you might see start to see now Venus uh, as a clear uh, half Venus shape. Uh, a lot of times I show it to kids and they go, hey, that's the moon. Well, no, but it's the, uh, uh, the half moon of Venus. And over the next month, uh, you'll see Venus go from uh, a, a mostly half, uh, half moon shape to uh, you'll see the 
crescent become more pronounced and you'll see it starting to get a lot larger. So Venus is going to get larger uh, as the next uh, couple months go by and will be a good thing to see uh, in a telescope. Or hey, John, just sorry to interrupt. We can't sure. see the uh, your slides on the Zoom. Okay. Um, I'll have to just cry to someone on that. Um, can't see my, yeah, no. Okay, just stand by a moment. Oh yeah, how how's the sound coming through? I ask with the sound. Sounds good. Good. Okay, but you're not seeing the slides at all. Yeah, it looks like it's just not being shared because we're seeing the video of you, just not the slides. Okay, um, you got the worst of the two choices there. So we'll just uh, try to get the slides back because I do think the slides are more important than seeing me. If I'd known that's all you'd see, I'd wear a different shirt. Is that yep. That's the presenter's view. Well, it's a uh, better than nothing. If it's the presenter's view, uh, can work with that. Uh, he says uh, he sees the presenter's view, so he sees what um, uh, I'm supposed to see, but others are supposed to see the uh, full screen. But I don't care any notes. I mean, there's. Um, but Sam, there is a swap displays button on top uh, left of the screen. Yeah. There you go. We have the full presentation. Okay. Sounds like we're in business. Uh, for those of you who missed things, I'm going to give you a quick, really fast recap, uh, talking about Venus and then making jokes about binoculars and that if you do have a Hollywood pair of binoculars, you're probably seeing double on Venus. And so uh, the joke was very important. Um, anyway, so... This is what you might see Venus doing over the next month. If you're looking at it through a telescope, you might see it a uh, half Venus and then it would grow in size, but also be, start to see the forming of a crescent. And uh, then uh, looking at Venus, I'm, I'm now photographing a little bit higher. So I'm continuing with the normal presentation done with the recap. And here's Venus and I pointed my camera up a little higher and there's where Mars is. So Mars is also uh, high in the uh, West uh, this time of year. I, last star party I had set up for a school, uh, you really couldn't see any features on Mars, but uh, kids were reporting that they were seeing a hint of white and a lot of red. So I was assuring them that they're probably seeing the ice cap, uh, at least the color from the ice caps and, and the planets. Um, Mars is right next to Castor and Pollux, the stars in Gemini. And uh, let me just ask, did the screen go blank on anyone else? Because this screen's going blank and no one else is seeing that. Okay, okay, that's okay, fine, fine. Um, anyway, so uh, Castor and Pollux of Gemini, the twins constellation, or we're near where Mars is. And so here's how the constellation is often traced out. And over the next month, Venus is going to rise higher and be among the stars Castor and Pollux and Mars will kind of move a little bit. So by the end of the month, you'll be seeing all four of those objects in a nice little cluster in the Western sky. The stars will be getting lower and lower and the planets will be getting up a little bit higher, but uh, so they'll both be uh, in view for a good, a little bit longer. Now, shortly after dark, uh, I would encourage you to look as far south as you can. I'm always very intrigued by the southern view, you know, um, the because for we the southern the south represents this vast area of unexplored sky and uh, unlike the north we see it rotating spinning around uh, the north pole so the south always intrigues me but if you go out in the desert or get a low horizon you might see omega centauri and omega centauri is a misnamed globular cluster it's given a star designation because it's a looks like a bright star in the constellation centaurus um, but it's actually a magnificent globular cluster and just above Centaurus, Centaurus seems to be a pretty wide spread out constellation, but an even wider strung out constellation is the constellation Hydra, which is right above Centaurus if you're looking south right now. 
And here's a wider field view of that same area. You can see a car approaching um, in the distance. And fortunately, that car had the old fashioned headlights and not the new LED high beams because uh, it would have been annoying for miles. And this way, it's only with the old lights, they're only annoying for about 100 yards. But anyway, um, you can see Omega Centauri down there, uh, a little bit to the left, and Hydra and Centaurus. And off to the right um, is Antlia, the pump, and Vela, the sails. And here's a few dark sky, deep sky objects in that area. I've seen and recorded three of them. The others are on my to-do list. And one of the best ones, of course, as I alluded to earlier, is Omega Centauri, which is good in binoculars, by the way. And um, But anyway, this one, binoculars are a telescope. Now it's the time to see it. And it, does, uh, it shows up really nice if you get the clear conditions. But it is low, so you're looking through a lot of atmosphere up high, uh, M68, a globular cluster, uh, tiny, tiny, but uh, it, it, you can see it in a large telescope and it does photograph pretty well. And then um, M83, M83 was a big surprise. Uh, I don't claim to be a great astrophotographer. I use the photographs merely to demonstrate that I can actually find the stuff that I'm recommending to you all to look at. But um, M83 was one of those where I just threw the, the small scope at it, uh, uh, photographed for about a minute or so, and I was really surprised with how bright and beautiful it is. So it looks like a great target. If you haven't uh, tried to image it or, or look at it, uh, you should definitely give it a, a look or a photo session. And now I'm going to do what they do. It used to do in the old days where you had a slide. If you rotated your camera 90 degrees, all you had to do is rotate your slide 90 degrees and everything would be fine. But on the computer, we kind of have to do a little uh, stretching and fitting. And so I've rotated my camera to show that right above Hydra is the constellation Corvus. And Corvus sits right above um, Omega Centauri. So if you can see the four prominent stars of, of, of uh, Corvus, look down below and you may find uh, Omega Centauri. And Corvus represents the crow. And uh, there's, it's between Virgo and Crater. And here's some dark sky, ob, uh, deep sky uh, objects uh, in there. And so let me show you, oh, M61, 68, I've already shown you that, but uh, here it is again. And then uh, M104, the famous Sombrero galaxy, I have it in the not sombrero position. And that's because I usually put my camera on my telescope at the same orientation every time, which is kind of useful to me. And so it just happens to be sideways um, when, I, when I rotate it toward that. And uh, NGC 4361, I have a thing for planetary nebula. And so there's that beautiful planetary nebula. Uh, this one, I actually did a little bit of stacking to get the image to show up, but it looks like it's got a lot of nebulosity around the brightest portion. So it would be a very interesting object to study. And now we're going to next, we're going to go on to Virgo. And here's an example, a little bit, uh, an earlier picture I took many years ago. And uh, it kind of shows where Corvus is in relation to the constellation Virgo. And Virgo, as it's commonly traced, sure looks like a person who is reading a book. So that's how I'm portraying Virgo as the uh, astronomy major uh, reading a book. This time of year, May, when Virgo is prominent, is very fitting because she would be studying for her final exams. And if you trace Virgo throughout the night and imagine a person reading and studying throughout the night, you know how that position gets more and more reclined as the time goes on. And that's how Virgo uh, ends up. So anyway, um, what I've taken is my picture of Virgo. I actually took it 90 degrees turned to what you're seeing here. And that's why you see the, the left side brighter because that's actually lower to the ground. But I got it to fit on the screen by rotating rotating it 90 degrees. And um, Leo the lion is up above uh, uh, Virgo. And the uh, uh, Coma Berenices uh, star cluster and um, uh, constellation is right in that area. And the Coma Berenices star cluster is very good in binoculars. Uh, I, I didn't do the binocular uh, figure eight thing for that one. Anyway, in this area, Virgo is a um, multitude of galaxies, almost uncountable a number of galaxies. And so um, some, but before we go into some of those, uh, there's a, a bright globular cluster, M53. And if you have a wide field of view, you might be able to capture NGC 5053 in the same field of view as M53. So this field of view that you see here is from my three inch telescope at F5. And I only discovered that I had both of them in the field of view. Now I know when I go back out there, I just rotate my camera 90 degrees on my telescope and I should be able to get both of them uh, comfortably within the field of view. And so, uh, but these uh, galaxy clusters that you see here uh, traced out in uh, Virgo, you can just take a, a camera, uh, 
you know, just let it soak in that area and you're going to pick up a lot of galaxies. And so, for example, here, uh, let's see this one, M100. Uh, this photo I took from my home in, in Wildemar. Uh, took it from my, my back porch. Um, and then as I just a little bit of processing on the computer was able to bring out just so many other NGC galaxies around the galaxies uh, M99 and, and M100. And here's uh, another one that uh, uh, three years ago, I learned that there was a supernova in it. Uh, M, let's see, was it M61? And it's right there. And so uh, I never caught a picture of M61 until I realized that there was a supernova and it was late in the season. I was able to, to get this. So I was kind of pleased with that. But this year is my chance to get a picture of M61 without it being photobombed by a supernova. And then, um, okay, so from, Lee, from uh, Virgo, we're going to go this way, which is actually uh northernly you know, along the horizon and that's going to bring us to the constellation Bo Bootes and uh up here in the corner is the um uh end star of the Big Dipper's handle and uh Virgo is off to off to the right and so there's a few bright objects in there some of them I've already shown and this one M3 is really refreshing because this time of year we start to crave some really bright a stunning object that you can show to kids in telescopes at star parties. And so M3 kind of takes the place of our losing some of our, our winter constellations. Um, also, in my particular obsession is planetary nebula. So there's NGC 6058, and it just shows up as like a little green dot. And as many of us know, there's no green stars. But when you see something green that looks like a star, it's just kind of exciting, even though it's a you know, it's so small that it's just a dot, but uh, uh, that's what this planetary nebula at least looks like through my little three inch scope. And then M51 is always quite quite a pleasure to see. Uh, uh, you can see it pretty well in, in an eight inch scope uh, and it shows up really nice in a three inch scope when photographing. And now I'm gonna go a little farther into uh, the Big Dipper area. And so here's the Big Dipper and the stars, these are the stars that actually give the Big Dipper its name, Ursa Major. They look like a bear, the, the large bear. And so that's how I've often seen the bear rendered, and it does look like a bear to me. And uh, uh, right now, great play thing about looking at uh, Ursa Major is that it's at its highest point. Uh, so it's uh, you get out there in the early evening, it's rotated directly above north, and so uh, it's a good time to see some of those objects because they're going to be they're about as high as they're going to get. Between the Big Dipper and the Little Dipper below it uh, starts the tail of Draco the Dragon, and there's uh, Canis Fanatici. And then uh, uh, Camelopardalis, uh, the giraffe. I think the giraffe is a bit of a stretch, but um, it's uh, supposedly there's a giraffe constellation there. And uh, here's a bunch of dark sky uh, objects. And so I'll start with, let's see, I'm gonna start, I've already done M3, so I'm gonna start with M101 and kind of work around in a circle. M101 with a little three inch telescope, uh, that, taking a, you know, a couple minute exposure. And then uh, OM51, that's a repeat. And then the M63, kind of a dense, uh, uh, bright little galaxy. Same thing for M94 and M106. And then uh, M109, and this is another one of my wide field ones where you can just see uh, the more you soak in that area, the more uh, other galaxies start to appear. And then one of my favorites, the Owl Nebula, uh, Planetary Nebula, uh, M97 next to uh, M108. And then, of course, M92 and M91, also in uh, uh, Ursa Major. So uh, beautiful, beautiful time to look at, at those constellations. And uh, by the time I've done that, um, I'm probably going to be too tired to look at Leo. And I've reflected that in my own presentation. I didn't get around to putting describing much in Leo. But Leo is up high. I take my word for it. There's um, a couple good uh, uh, galaxy clusters in, in Leo and a nice carbon star and even the famous Wolf 359 of Star Trek lore where a famous battle takes place sometime in the future. So um, thank you. I hope uh, you get out um, into the desert or something like that into a dark location. I'll be back in Ju June uh, and uh, we'll see you then. Thank you. Thank you, John, for a wonderful presentation. Uh, we love that it's all practical with only what you've done yourself and looking forward to see you uh, next month in June. And I have to apologize to you and our audience for the technical difficulties that we're yet to overcome. Uh, we promise that we are working on them and rehearsing before every presentation, uh, but just Zoom and the setup never fails to surprise us. 
Hi, my name is Reza and I'm the vice president of the club. Uh, I too would like to welcome you to this general meeting of the Orange County Astronomers on May 12th, 2023. And without any further ado, let me go into go ahead into introducing our speaker for this meeting. Um, our, speaking, our speaker at this meeting received his PhD in astronomy from Columbia University in 1986 before he went to NASA Goddard Space Flight Center as a National Research Council postdoc. He then joined the Department of Physics and Astronomy at Northwestern University in 1989 and has been there since. His research interests are black hole at the center of the galaxy, star formation, and cosmic ray physics. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Farhad Youssefzadeh. Farhad. Uh, you need to unmute yourself. Let me. That's what I thought. Okay, but I, I'm not seeing my own uh, slides yet. Okay, um, I believe the per people in the in uh, person crew need to stop sharing their presentation, uh, so we can start ours. Can you see Let my slide see. now? Okay, I, I believe you do need to reshare your screen. Uh, right, right, yes. yes. Okay. Let me. And if you could uh, okay. uh, also make sure to share the computer audio if that's an option during the sharing. Share screen. Okay. We're going <laughs> wrong places. <laughs> okay. Uh, you should be able to see this slide, correct? Right. We have your slide full screen right Can now. Can you hear me okay? Yes, all fine. Okay. So let me just also change my pen. Okay. Oh, right. by the way, uh, before going on, let me actually remind the audience that our speaker tonight appreciates being interrupted with questions. So feel free to uh, send the questions uh, midway as well. Okay, thank you, please. Okay, great, great. Thank you very much for inviting me. I appreciate the organizers for asking me to, asking me to give a presentation on the work that I've been doing for the last few years. So... Let me start off by showing you an image of the galactic center. This is a radio image of the center of the galaxy. And you see these um, features, these long uh, filamentary structures and wispy structures throughout this region. And I'm gonna be mainly focusing on the nature of these, uh, uh, these filamentary structures. These features are only found in the center of our own Milky Way galaxy. So to in some extent, they're unique in our own galaxy. But now, more recently, um, these uh, filamentary structures found in other galaxies. So hopefully I'll have time to also show you these, uh, these, uh, uh, these filaments as well outside our own Milky Way galaxy. But before I actually uh, get into discussing and showing you what these features um, tell us and what's the mystery behind the nature of these filamentary structures that I wanna just put things in, in context and just um, discuss and describe other filamentary structures in different environments. So this is a... Um, uh, let me start with a with the filamentary structures in and on a microscopic scale. So this is a mycelium, and uh, this is a, some uh, fungus, I think related to mushrooms and all vegetables have them as well. And you can see this network of filaments that are all sort of tangled together and they show uh, sort of some structures pattern here. And now if you go to a larger scale, if you look at the Earth's atmosphere, sometimes these wispy structures show up some some um, uh, parallel structures showing up across uh, the Earth's atmosphere, and um, and that's another sort of organized structures that you find in the Earth's atmosphere. Even on a larger scale, you look at this uh, beautiful, beautiful image of um, uh, what I, uh, 
uh, Aurora Borealis, all these uh, sort of uh, brush strokes or these filamentary structures are converging towards the North Pole. And uh, you can see these are sort of curtains of uh, features that are showing up um, due to the excitation of oxygen atom. And they just converge to a, to a point in the North Pole. And then on a larger scale, if you look at the commentary tales, you also find these uh, remarkable uh, parallel structures that are showing up uh, in the tail of a comet. And why is it the width of these guys certain size? And what is the spacing between these guys? What keeps some features are a little bit longer than others? These are all interesting questions related to cometary tails. And even in our own galaxy, you find that stars are born along the filamentary um, molecular clouds. So this is showing the one, uh, the figure to the left shows a, a dust map of, of a filamentary structures where you find the initial conditions of star formation taking place. And the figure to the right shows the skeleton of this sort of um, star stellar cores that are identified along these filamentary structures. So star formation happened to actually be a lot, um, uh, it, it likes the environment when it's more uh, filamentary also. This is all fairly recent results in the last maybe 10, 15 years or so. Uh, people are finding these, uh, these uh, filamentary uh, molecular clouds uh, within which stars are born. Now, when I mean, you look at the scale, the largest scale um, in the universe, these are cosmic filaments that you find. And the figure to the left shows a strip of uh, galaxies as we go away from the Milky Way galaxy with different redshifts. And you find uh, galaxies also not randomly distributed in, in the redshift space. They show, uh, they seem to be showing up along these filamentary structures. And there are obviously holes in between them. Uh, and somehow these, these galaxies are born along filaments as well. Similar to what you find also stellar cores along molecular clouds that are elongated, you also find galaxies in the early universe are born along these filamentary uh, cosmic web. And the figure to the right shows a simulation of how galaxies are formed. This is, um, you see this web of filamentary structures, but galaxies, young galaxies are formed along these filamentary structures. And this is obviously, early universe, the dark matter is dominating the gravitational potential in this region. Uh, but these are all sort of indicating something very interesting that filamentary structures have a role to play for creation of uh, protostars and also galaxies. And of course, in different contexts, what are the roles? So I am going to just also uh, show you that artists have also been very much inspired by, um, by the kind of structures that astronomers are finding. And this is an installation that was inspired by cosmic web that I just showed you in the previous picture. And people are fascinated by the, by networking of these structures and they connected to a, a global globalization uh, concept. So this is also, this is something that artists have also been inspired. And uh, if you look at some of uh, the paintings that have been done uh, by artists in the early part of the 20th century, uh, they have been also very much inspired by the birth uh, or, or of, of planets. And you can see these uh, uh, brushes and these, these filamentary structures are all there. Um, and you look at another picture showing that how uh, the earth is being formed. You can see these 
uh, lines that are all uh, presenting something interesting about these uh, these filamentary structures. So it, it's uh, it's hard to make a, too much out of these figures, but it is artists get inspired by nature and the wonders that we all experience and we 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 love, and, uh, and it's wonderful to see that as well among artists to do that. Uh, get inspired by things like this. And this is also another picture showing these uh, sort of filamentary structures also showing up in their pictures. Um, so having given you a, a sort of an introduction that filamentary structures are formed in different environments and for different, obviously, origins, they have different origins and different reasons why they are there. So I'm going to now focus uh, the rest of the uh, hour on filamentary structures near the center of the galaxy. This is one of my favorite pictures showing their bunch of uh, filaments that are showing up parallel to each other. It's almost like a harp-like structures. And these are radio images at the wavelength of 20 centimeter. They sort of start out about maybe five to 20 light years uh, in their lengths. And uh, so it's about some some of these can be actually um, the the length to width could be up to order of uh, sometimes hundred, uh, but typically about twenty or so is the typical uh, length to width of these filamentary structures. So the question is that how do they how does how does nature um, create these structures? How is it that you have the interstellar medium, the medium between stars, is very um, very diffuse and very, uh, you know, it's like vastness of nothingness there. And then all of a sudden, out of nothing, all of a sudden, you see these beautiful structures organized. It's almost as if the Saturn rings. And how do they get there to the first? What, what essentially uh, the reason that, that nature basically shapes these structures? And this is what I'm going to be talking about, even though it's actually very look beautiful but it's actually very dramatic as well because the features that you see, radio features that you see here, these are produced by uh, electrons that are uh, sort of uh, um, moving at the relativistic regime. So they're, they're moving close to the speed of light and they're producing this kind of radiation. So we're gonna be talking about that in, in more detail. Um, and so just, Coming back to the point of what uh, what really keeps um, what's the origin of the shape of clouds? You know, if you in a beautiful sunny day, for example, I'm sure you have many many <laughs> beautiful days in California. You see this blue sky and you see these puffy clouds. So again, we have we have this vastness of um, air molecules and they're diffuse. You hardly can see them, and all of a sudden, out of nothing. Uh, and that nothing that's then all of a sudden you see these poofy clouds and uh, how, what, how does it, how, what's the shape? How did it get there in the first place? We have some ideas here. You know, if you have a hot you know, day, the air is warm and its buoyancy keeps it uh, in, and just pushes it up and it gets elevated to higher elevations. And of course you just condensation happens and, and they basically punch into a small, cloudlets and then start these poofy clouds starts expanding and expanding and expanding. So these are all water droplets condensations that happen as air molecules uh, uh, get condensed at higher elevations. But the question is that you know what do we what can we say about these um, these structures? How do they get there? What what uh, really is responsible for formation of these uh, organize the structures and they're all magnetized. So, um, so this is uh, the um, outline of my presentation, a little bit of a history of how these uh, filaments were, were uh, found uh, in the eighties. And I don't have much time to really talk about radio telescopes. I know you all uh, really using optical telescopes, <laughs> um, but uh, but there are some really interesting things uh, about radio telescopes and how they differ 
from optical telescopes. And then I'll focus on galactic center filaments and galaxy cluster filaments and what we think the origin of these filamentary structures are. So just give a, a bit more introduction. Uh, so I, I know you probably know all of these things, but I just uh, give a lot, of, a lot more introduction for those who are not familiar um, with the shape of the galaxy. Uh, the, we live in a disk of, uh, of, uh, of our own Milky Way galaxy, and it has all kinds of spiral structures. This is a schematic diagram uh, being uh, looked at from face on. And um, the place that we are talking about today is uh, right at the center of the galaxy uh, with the red elliptical structures that you see. There is a galactic bar here. This bar is a star that is tilted with respect to the line of sight. So the sun is located here. You're looking toward the center of the galaxy. There is this galactic potential, it's barred potential. Um, uh, uh, showing up also along, uh, you know, at, at about 45 degrees or so. And uh, so, we're, but we're focusing mainly really uh, within a few hundred parsecs of the galaxy. Um, I'm assuming a parsec is about three light years. So we're talking about the inner thousand light years of the galaxy. And, um, and uh, what you see at the center of the galaxy within that scale if you look at it with your optical telescopes, you find pretty much nothing really, uh, because there's so many clouds along the line of sight. Um, the constellation Sagittarius um, is is not really; it's just foreground objects. It doesn't really tell you anything about um, about the center of the galaxy. And if you look at the same region in uh, radio at radio wavelengths, you find it's a very complicated region of the galaxy. Uh, right at the center of the galaxy, there is a supermassive black hole. And this, uh, this black hole was uh, recently imaged. And I have enlarged it by some 300, whatever, close to a million or so. So this is only about the size of a 50 micro arc seconds. So this is a, a huge achievement that radio astronomers have had, um, continuing from the time that Jansky discovered uh, radio noise from the sky all the way down to today is still make, making uh, huge discoveries. And this is one of the, um, uh, one of the discoveries that they made uh, more recently. Uh, but on a larger scale, you can see that there are all kinds of structures here. There are uh, supernova remnants here that you see. There are uh, H2 regions associated with young uh, stellar objects that are showing up here. And then you see this diffuse emission all along the plane of the galaxy. So this, so this is a plane of the galaxy. And then you see these sort of a wispy vertical structures that we're talking about. Um, and uh, this is uh, the radio arc. And those are unusual because they, you can't really connect it to anything else that we know. It's unusual. Uh, so that's how, um, these are, these are radio filaments that I'll be talking about. And this image is at a wavelength of uh, 90 centimeter and a few degrees across. So uh, let's just go one more time, a brief journey through the center of the galaxy. And uh, so it starts out with, uh, with optical image of the sky and then you just um, uh, going really fast uh, faster than the speed of light, much faster, and going towards the center of the galaxy. And you see from uh, optical to infrared and eventually radio. And that's where you see the black hole, the shadow of the black hole that is shown here. So let's see if this works. Uh, we don't have sound. Uh-oh, uh -oh. again, <laughs> really? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Let, let's try it again. Well, anyways, uh, it's okay. It doesn't really tell okay. you much. The, the sound, I'm afraid you have to hear me. <laughs> uh, sure. Uh, it's not as pretty as the, the background. The point is that the optical now just get converted into uh, infrared uh, stars. And we can see all kinds of dust clouds also. Um, and you see sort of a, towards the center of the galaxy, it's like a jewel box. 
lots and lots of stars, different evolutionary phase. And as you get closer and closer and closer, we find there is a radio source that uh, has 4 million solar mass. Uh, it's a source of the 4 million solar mass black hole. So we have a fairly good evidence, the distance and the mass of the black hole. And, um, and the thing that uh, we are trying to figure out is actually the spin of the black hole, how fast it is rotating. So that's um, where we are. Okay, let me see if I can go. Okay, so, any questions before we we continue? These are all very introductory material I'm talking about. <laughs> um, oh yeah, I see no questions coming in, but uh, okay. please send us okay. your questions. Uh, oh, they, they, there is an in-person question. Uh, let's check. I'll pause again, um, and you can read to me. Uh, yeah, sure. That's uh, Barbara. You have a question. We cannot hear you. Uh, looks like they have no, not yet. We cannot hear you. Uh, well, let microphone. me. Yeah, well, there'll be more time to. Uh, there. To can you hear me now? Uh, yes, oh, okay. we can hear you. Sorry. Okay, wait, wait. it didn't go on all the way. Uh, we do have a, a question here, sir. Can you see redshift with radio telescopes? Uh, you can see redshift with atomic hydrogen. You can do ionized gas. You can do, yeah, that's, that's uh, you can do that uh, with redshift of objects, but not, not stars. Uh, but you can see all kinds of, any, any object that has some line emission, you can actually figure out. In fact, radio uh, telescopes are now uh, trying to detect the earliest uh, hydrogen atom that was formed at a at a very high redshift, the highest redshift you can imagine. I forget exactly uh, what it is. It's in the uh, must be in the uh, hundred. So people actually are looking at very very low uh, radio uh, uh, wavelengths, um, long wavelengths uh, to get a signature of the earliest. Uh, uh, the, we call it the dark ages. So yeah, just give you an example that the radio folks also detect redshifts of uh, atomic clouds and molecules and whatnot. Okay, great. So let me uh, continue with uh, with um, an image of a, a, a probably the most uh, important, the most famous radio observatory. Uh, not far from where you guys are, it's in New Mexico. And this is the very large array of radio telescopes. And I recommend, I highly recommend you to, uh, when you go in that part of the uh, the country, close to Albuquerque, take a look at these uh, this, this uh, incredible site. Uh, it's a beautiful site. And there are 27 telescopes uh, and operating almost 24-7. Uh, so I uh, was a student at the time at uh, Columbia and uh, my first project actually was, uh, not first, maybe the second project was to uh, use this observatory uh, to look at the center of the galaxy. And we were looking at um, objects that are very compact and uh, supposed to be early stars uh, in radio, at radio wavelength. And this was also during a time that the telescope was um, uh, being commissioned. So it was a very exciting time. Uh, and I was there to just uh, learn something new and observe for the first time. And uh, lo and behold, I, I, um, I found something very interesting. And this is a radio image of, uh, of the inner uh, sort of uh, maybe roughly about 30 arc minutes of the center of the galaxy. The black hole is sitting right here, the supermassive black hole, Psi J star. And this is the plane of the galaxy. And uh, I found these, uh, uh, with my collaborators, found these, these filamentary structures that are running perpendicular to the plane of the galaxy. So this was the first indication that you have these structures showing up in a direction, an odd direction, and there is no source that is producing these structures. 
So it was just basically wispy structure showing up. And for quite some time, we thought that it's actually an artifact. Uh, and it was due to the fact that this telescope was being commissioned. So still a lot of people really didn't know exactly what uh, artifacts we have, what we don't have. And uh, so it was an exciting time. And eventually at some point, uh, four o'clock in the morning in the moment of Euroka uh, hit on me that we actually, uh, I'm, I'm getting rid of things that are for real. And uh, so it was really exciting from then on uh, to try to learn more about these, these, um, these structures. Uh, we knew about structures before supernova remnants and H2 regions and nuclei of galaxies in radio, but this was, uh, I think people really were surprised that you actually can form a, a narrow structures running perpendicular to the plane. Uh, and it's also uh, relativistic electrons radiating so, or synchrotron radiation. So that, that was the mystery that how do, you, how do you accelerate particles to such high energies? That, that's, the, that, that's the first question that everybody wants to know uh, because it's not easy to basically have these electrons that are running around in the diffuse interstellar medium that have about maybe one EV per centimeter. You know, the, the, the energy density is very low and all of a sudden you increase their energies by a factor of a billion, for example. And that's what these guys are. They're GeV electrons that are radiating at radio wavelength. So 20 years later, um, it was now recognized that there are a lot of these filaments showing up in the inner few hundred parsecs of the galaxy. And there are many different collaborators, many different people worked on this and they found this, uh, this source and that source. And, and just basically it was sort of stamp collecting. We were trying to figure out what the physical uh, nature of these, these structures are. And they are uh, linearly polarized. I don't have time to really go into details of uh, polarization here, but it was uh, fairly known that most of these filaments show up to be perpendicular to the plane of the galaxy. And why is it running perpendicular to the plane of the galaxy? And these are all magnetized structures also. And, uh, but there was no particular source that tell us what is accelerated? What is the accelerator? What is really responsible for producing these, these structures um, in such a fashion? Now, there is actually another remarkable structure in the Milky Way galaxy. This is the elephant in the, in the Milky Way galaxy. This is the Fermi bubble that extends from basically the nucleus of our Milky Way galaxy, and it goes up to 80, 90 degrees above the plane of the galaxy. This is probably the largest structure in, that the, we have in our own Milky Way galaxy, apart from the disk itself. And so the, the interesting thing is that um, you find these very unique structures towards nuclear galaxies. The environments are different than the rest of the galaxy. The same can be said about this. Uh, these structures are found only in the center of the galaxy. So this is interesting. So the environment must be different. Something really is doing, the environment is doing something to formation of these guys. And of course, we only have one supermassive black hole at the center of the galaxy. And so this, this, uh, these two examples remind me of a story that I read, it was online, uh, about a famous artist, a violinist, uh, who uh, did an experiment and he played at Grand Central um, in New York City for 45 minutes or so. And, and he collected about uh, $30 in, incognito. And, uh, and people came in, a few people clapped and a few, nobody recognized him. And, and but two nights earlier, the same person, um, played in Boston Orchestra and people were paying about hundred bucks for a ticket. And his, his violin is about three and a half million dollars <laughs> alone. So, and he obviously shown uh, differently in different environments. An ordinary environment, basically nobody recognized them. Nobody really paid attention to who he is. And yet, when you go to an extraordinary place uh, where people appreciate you, he shined 
uh, tremendously in those environments. So the point is that environments um, uh, it, it are important for uh, creation of extraordinary objects, whether we have it in the universe or in other places in a social setting. So that just um, thought that it's actually useful to sort of connect these things together because these are structures that we find unusual, unique structures that we find in our own galaxy. They're found in environments that are very unique. And uh, so Fermi um, bubbles and also these filamentary structures and the black hole at the center of the galaxy and a whole bunch of other things that, you know, uh, that we are finding in nuclear galaxies are just belong in the environment that is actually allowing to, for these guys to be created. So now before I actually start talking about science results, I wanna just pause and see if you have any questions. Um, any, uh, just before we go on uh, to talking about what we have learned um, by looking at these uh, filamentary structures. Okay, sure. So let me do another call for questions. I believe the <laughs> person audience are being checked for questions. Um, I honestly like to have some kind of interaction. It's very hard because for me, it's almost like I'm talking to a wall. You know, it's not, I wish I could be there, meet you. And there's, this, this, there's something really, really much more uh, remarkable about actually when people just talk to each other and looking at each other and just the interaction part is, is really much, much better. And I noticed that during um, the pandemic, my students hardly ask any questions. It was really difficult. But when uh, we got back to, uh, you know, in-person classes, uh, people ask uh, uh, a lot of questions, a lot more um, than before, for sure. So anyways, I mean, maybe at the uh, end. Let me see. Ba Barbara, do you have any questions from the in-person audience? Um, I don't know about anybody in the audience. I did have, sort of have one question uh, coming out of that example that was given with the violinist. Is it possible that there are similar structures that we just are not recognizing in, in environments outside of the center of our galaxy? Well, so far, there. Uh, I mean, there we haven't really looked at every detail, every bit of uh, of the galaxy, right? <laughs> there are certainly unique structures, or in our Milky Way galaxy as well, outside the nucleus. Um, but but there are some yeah I think it's uh, it, again that's also depends what environment it is as well uh, but it's not as dramatic as what you find in nuclear galaxies um, they're they're just yeah I mean and in some ways uh, sometimes it's good and sometimes bad because for example if you have a supermassive black hole at the center of the galaxy it's really difficult to form stars near it. Whereas that's not exactly what you want. You want to see stars. The stars formed uh, in spiral arm, in in you know, in the outside outside the nucleus, a lot better in a sense. Um, it's good that we are not at the center of the galaxy. Tidal forces would actually just uh, pulls us apart um, because the concentration of stars is a lot more there. Tides, tidal effects are are critical uh, uh, for basically having an object to stay intact, you see? So, yeah, I mean, it's not, uh, but generally, generally you see it's a lot of more power comes from the nuclear galaxies because of the concentration of stars and black holes and whatnot. And there is there are a few more questions. So uh, you mentioned that there you could not attribute any source to these kind of filaments. However, by just looking at their shape, they're kind of arced and they're near the galactic center. Can, yes. <laughs> can the black hole somehow has some effect on the creation? Well, I'll get back to that. That's related to the origin of the filament. So we haven't really okay. talked about okay. so so now about the, the structure of, of uh, the filaments and try to motivate you. And uh, we'll, we'll just get there sort of the, making the mystery of these guys a little bit deeper, <laughs> deep in the mystery of, of the origin of the filaments. Okay, so, perfect. And now there's this other question, uh, how permanent or how steady in time are these filaments? Uh, 
are they going to disappear pretty soon or uh, are they going to be there for a long time? Well, we know that from the lifetime of the electrons and um, how their colors look like, it's a, they're, they're a million years old, a few million years old already. And the, the beauty of uh, radio in, uh, is that uh, the amount of energy that they release is very small. So they can last for a long time. Uh, optical, x-rays, gamma rays, uh, they, uh, they don't really last too long because there's a lot of energy comes out. Uh, the energy rate is a lot higher. So as a result, they, uh, I mean, these filaments may have been actually uh, also showing up in x-rays and um, uh, optical at some point uh, early on, but their lifetime is really a lot shorter than, than, than radio. All right, thank you. Barbara, you have another question? Yeah, I think we have a couple here. Chris? <laughs> we have someone coming down to take the mic. <laughs> uh, hi. Um, with regard to those uh, RQ8 structures uh, out towards Sagittarius and all that, my first reaction when I very first saw them is I know they're in the direction of the core, but of course you have to determine their distance. So they're not, you know, 300 uh, parsecs away in the Scorpio Centaurus uh, star forming area. They look like supernovae shock waves or something like that to me at first reading, but you're confident these exist within the core at 10,000 parsecs. How did you make that determination? Well, we have a lot of measurements that we do from um, H1 absorptions, for example. So we have all these uh, basically ways that we can figure out uh, where they are. If they were local, for example, certain absorption lines would have not shown up, for example. Uh, so the distances, if you really want to know for sure exactly accuracy, it's, it's, it's a bit hard. Um, but we know that they are within the inner few hundred parsecs of the galaxy. So that, I think, is, uh, uh, is something. And it's, yeah. Oh, it's because of yeah. uh, because of other other studies showing where uh, what what where they are with respect to other objects that we know their distances. Good questions. Um, Let me continue. Or oh, go ahead. Yeah, we had another one here. Yeah. Um, the question was, what do you mean by nuclear galaxy? Uh, nuclear galaxy. I. I meant to say nu nuclear galaxies, sorry. <laughs> nuclear galaxies, the same nucleus of our own Milky Way galaxy. Uh, it's defined um, to within an, our own galaxy is a, you know, we call it the, the bulge. At the center of the bulge is the nucleus of the galaxy. And of course, the definition changes depending on which galaxy you're looking at. Uh, but that's where mature galaxies have a supermassive black hole at their centers. Uh, so the sphere of influence changes depending on what the mass of the black hole is. So our black hole is about a few uh, million solar masses. Uh, so the sphere of influence, maybe it's about a, a, a few parsecs. And then, but there is a large concentration of stars. Uh, the, lots of, uh, so the concentration of stars drop off. So within uh, the inner 500 to kiloparsecs of our own the center of the galaxy, we call that nucle nucleus, the nucleus of our own Milky Way galaxy. Okay, uh, great. I'm, I'm glad. Yeah, let, let, let's continue and we'll, we'll have another time for questions. Uh, yes, maybe yes. You... I, will have, I will have pause uh, as we go along so that I can, I can uh, um, uh, hear you with questions. Okay. So now we're going to talk a little bit about science and what really changed in the last uh, few years um, since VLA observations were done for a long time. So a, a new radio uh, uh, telescope array uh, got uh, built in South Africa. This is called Meerkat Observatory. Uh, this is a completely a brand new design also. This is, uh, some of you may know, these are off-axis uh, focal plane, essentially. So in other words, there is no, you don't have these leg supports, for example, the way you had for the VLA, 
And those are also always creates all kinds of noise and it obscures some of the radiation, even though it's not that significant, but it is, it's just creating some, some noise. So these are much cleaner systems. And this is, uh, we're talking about uh, something like about 60 of these guys, 64 of these telescopes were built in South Africa as part of a, um, you know, an array of telescopes that will eventually be part of a one kilometer, kilometer square array in in uh in in uh australia new zealand and uh so this is a prototype of that the the uh the square square uh, kilometer array so they started looking at the center of the galaxy obviously and they had uh just uh these they they mapped the entire region for the first time they spent over uh, a few hundred hours observing and they created some really the best survey of the center of the galaxy ever um and uh and it's it's just all brand new in a way they did the receivers were different so you could actually measure the changes that happens as a function of frequency within the same system of receivers it's actually a beautiful place rfi free for example 500 kilometer away from cape town and uh, of course, these days really doesn't matter that much. You could be basically in New York City um, and use a radio telescope because most of the noise is coming from satellites, and satellites are everywhere. Um, so there, but but there are some advantage. Mobile phone, for example, is not really uh, a problem. For example, in uh, in Cape Town and in, uh, in in where Meerkat Observatory. So. What I'm going to show you is some of the results that we've got by using this uh, radio observatory uh, that has really a, been a, a game changer as far as learning more about the properties of these, these filamentary structures. So this is uh, an image that showed up here. Um, I'm tilting it now. The plane of the galaxy runs diagonally and you can see these radio arc, the filaments, but then there's this huge bubble showed up uh, the other side of the bubble is not showing up because of this <laughs> artistic rendition of this image is obscuring it, but it is actually a, a, a 400 parsec bubble that shows up. And remarkably, almost all filaments that we see are uh, located within this bubble. And so that actually sort of says something interesting that there is this uh, bubble that created uh, probably some a major event that took place a few million years ago. And then you have this uh, filaments, uh, somehow the byproduct of that, that, that uh, event that took place a few million years ago. So this was a, uh, one of the sort of major results that came out of this radio bubble. Um, uh, just, uh, I think in 2019 um, and, uh, and, and this is an image now showing a 20 centimeter image of the center of the galaxy. And you can see the nucleus of the galaxy shows up in red where the black hole is. And you can see these filamentary structures showing up quite nicely away from the plane. So you have much, much better sensitivity and you can see these long structures. This is, we're talking about 30, 40 parsecs in in length here, this is called the snake filament. And um, so it's, uh, we use this image to also filter it and to bring out those filamentary structures. And I'm gonna show you what it looks like. It looks like a, a sort of a plane of the galaxy. It's looking more, more like a spaghetti uh, features. But then if you look at the, um, so let's see, hopefully this works the way I had it. It's a bit slow, but I'm zooming through these uh, above the plane. It worked earlier. Oh, okay. I think it's doing something. Okay, right. So now I'm just going over to show you basically what these structures look like. There are all kinds of structures. There are lots of structures that are parallel to each other. This is more like a harp structure. It's as if they're formed together. You see bending of the filaments. There are multiple filaments run um, towards each other, away from each other. And there are lots of clusters of filaments. And you see 
a spacing between them individually. And then you see now along the plane that I'll talk about in more detail, you can't really see details of this because it's highly saturated. Um, but there is actually also some interesting filamentary structures you find uh, in the plane of the, uh, the inner few hundred parsecs of the galaxy. But each of these little uh, features that you find um, is has their own, seem to be, have their own little stories. You see these cometary structures that you find here, it's as if they're converging to a point, then you see another one here, for example, and what is it really, what keeps these guys uh, so intact? You see these waterfall structures here. So, you know, it's it's an interesting, uh, how, do, how does nature work? These are all magnetized structures. And this is the snake feature that I was showing you. And this is a supernova remnants that we're all familiar with. So that was uh, really a remarkable uh, uh, a survey of the inner region. We've never had anything like this before. And this by itself, you can see that it's uh, just the variety, a variety of different structures are all by itself sort of should create some awe in you that how nature uh, does things like this. It's almost like those clouds that I showed you before. Um, what uh, What's responsible to keep these these uh, linear structures, filamentary structures, and together in a sense, um, and sometimes isolated. So, so having these images, uh, you know, sometimes we see these structures, for example, uh, two structures parallel together, and then all of a sudden they split into two. It's as if there is a stream uh, along the filament, and then they're breaking up by an obstacle, and it becomes uh, sort of forked into two components. And you see uh, a number of them like this also. You see another one here, for example. It's another magnetized structures. All of a sudden, the brightness changes, and sometimes they just break, break up into two components. Um, so there is, it's as if there is a stream uh, along these magnetized structures. I should say that properties of these structures are very different, very similar in a sense, to what you find in jets coming from nuclear galaxies, radio jets and optical jets. But there you have a good, you have a good anchor, you have a black hole, you have an accretion flow, you have something that is accelerating particles and ejecting them into the uh, into space. Here, there doesn't seem to be anything that we have found uh, to, to nail down what's responsible for these structures. But before I do that, I want to just talk a little bit about uh, what uh, what these the ingredient of these structures. I've already mentioned a few times that these filaments are synchrotron producing synchrotron radiation. But how? What is synchrotron radiation? In case some of you were not familiar with this, is that um, you know if you have a magnetic field, organized magnetic field, and you have uh, particles that are have a very high speed, for example. The magnetic field guides these electrons, charged particles, uh, to go around. And as they gyrate, they're gyrating almost close to the speed of light. And they basically emit light like a firefly. They're trapped into this sort of a magnetic field that is guiding and moving in the direction uh, away um, with some uh, sort of vertical motion. Um, but they also have some horizontal motion that they're trapped. And these almost all filaments that we see, they follow synchrotron radiation. And in some cases, we have a compact source here. So that's what we're exploring, that what is, is this compact source is responsible for producing the acceleration of the particles here. But whether this is just a by chance coincidence or is it something um, just that uh, it is doing the work more like a, 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 a stellar black hole or neutron stars or something. Um, but the nature of these filamentary structures is fairly well known. The common ingredient is that they are magnetized and they are producing synchrotron radiation. And that is uh, at least, and we know that it's polarized. We know the direction of the magnetic field all along the filaments themselves. And then they stop. 
they diffuse and they just stop. What keeps them from stopping? Why not going forever? <laughs> Anyways, um, I'm laughing at things that are mysterious. I shouldn't be laughing. But now, so Meerkat all of a sudden increased the number of filaments by a factor of 10. So this is about 1,000 filaments that are drawn here, uh, not by hand, by computers, basically, algorithms that goes through and measures each of these. And uh, so we, uh, we have a good, all of a sudden, we have a population of filamentary structures. This is actually really, really important to know because up until now, we've been looking at this area and that area and different collaborators and different colleagues all worked in different uh, pieces as together, but we've never had anything collectively that we can study together as a population. Uh, one thing you can see right away is that a lot of these filaments are running perpendicular to the plane. The plane of the Milky Way galaxy is going like this. The black hole is somewhere here. And then you can see these structures are all over and then they disappear. You don't really find them beyond uh, a couple of degrees, a few hundred parsecs, you just don't find this kind of thing. So they're all trapped into, uh, fall into that bubble that I mentioned before. So what is this telling us? The first thing it says is that you have uh, very energetic electrons uh, distributed or cosmic ray particles. Cosmic ray particles are protons and electrons mainly, and it could be also nuclei of atoms as well. And these particles always constantly bombard the top of the atmosphere, the Earth's atmosphere, and see these showers that are coming in, and uh, they penetrate even through the Earth. And um, But it turns out that if you just, even looking at these, measure what kind of energy density that uh, these filaments are creating, it's about a thousand times more than what you find elsewhere in the plane of the Milky Way galaxy. So um, this is a this is a, a factory of cosmic ray particles that are generated in this part of the galaxy. Now, now that we have this population of filaments, what do you do with it? What's okay? So far we've been stamp collecting, but now you can actually learn some physical properties of these filaments. So how do we go about learning about physical properties? Well, it's easy. You just say, okay, what's the length distribution? So you make a histogram of the number of filaments as a function of length of these filaments. You know, we assume that they are at the center of the galaxy. You think they are at the center of the galaxy and you just find the distribution of it. This is a power law distribution of filaments lengths. And then you also look at the brightness. You look at how bright they are and you can see there's a peak here and this is the mean brightness and then the lots, a lot smaller number of bright filaments. Uh, you can see the brightness changes as it go to the right. And then the, 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 the number of filaments brightness decrease rapidly as it gets to fainter objects. Now, so you may say, well, why there is such an asymmetry? On the one hand, they're not equal, uh, but that's actually an interesting question because we don't have the sensitivity to see faint features here. So if we have more data, we should be able to go fainter and see whether we follow something there are, so it is possible that there are more filaments, but they're much fainter also. So that's one of the projects that we're gonna be uh, looking at. So, you know, just, it's not telling you much. It doesn't give you a lot of insight by just going through these population studies and learning about the statistics of these, but you need to have a physical, you know, learn about physical properties of these guys before you really get a full uh, understanding of these, the nature of these sources. Now, one thing that came out very recently, so I, I'm actually presenting something that is about to be published in, um, I think, in the next few <laughs> weeks uh, in the Astrophysical Journal letter. It's, uh, so we studied um, the position angle of these filaments. So these filaments all have different, different angles with respect to the plane of the galaxy. So we were curious to know, as I mentioned before, I said, well, there are a lot of these filaments are vertical, right? You can see that they're all vertical. When it's vertical, it means that it has a 
position angle of zero degrees, right? So, so if you look at this, you can find that long filaments, when you look at the number of filaments as a function of their angles, how they're positioned, um, it peaks right around when it's in the direction perpendicular to the plane of the galaxy. Now, if you do look at the same distribution, you find that there are two populations now. For shorter filaments, you find the ones that are perpendicular to the plane, but also you find the ones that are parallel to the feature, parallel to the plane of the galaxy. So now all of a sudden you have bimodal distribution. You have, it's as if you have two populations of filaments. One long filaments running mainly perpendicular to the plane, and then another one that is shorter filaments that are parallel. So what does that tell us? So here is a pictorial image of the position angle distribution. If you didn't believe my histogram diagrams um, that a computer basically generated, but now you can see it with your eyes that all the filaments are drawn here uh, with an algorithm that identifies each filament and find the length and all that. And, and uh, you can see the position angle is showing up here. So zero degree and 180 degrees, red and blue. So red and blue, you can see they're all vertical, right? That makes sense? <laughs> it's hard to see <laughs> online to say, you know, see whether I'm, I'm making sense. But anyways, I'm not saying anything profound here. The point is that the yeah, it does. Yeah, long filaments. Yeah, thank you. Long filaments are vertical, but now all of a sudden you see a lot of these now uh, short filaments seem to be running um, parallel to the film, parallel to the plane of the galaxy, and they show up a lot better in the negative longitude side of the galactic plane. So that's that's a pictorial, and so I'm just zooming now only a small region. Right here, for example, this is the area that I selected so that you can see for yourself that these parallel structures are showing up. Um, this is the plane of the galaxy goes like this. And these are, you can see these parallel structures here. And, and this is the distribution showing up how these structures in this region shows a peak at about 90 degree, which is right along the galactic plane. Now, so this is all this is all nice. Okay, what is it really telling us? But actually, what is really interesting about these filaments is that they're not exactly parallel. They're radial and they're pointing in the direction where the black hole is. I wish I could just give you some plot, show you the plots that indicates this, but it's a bit involved, very involved. I don't have the time to do it, but it is actually, you can see that many filaments actually are pointing in the direction towards the center of the galaxy. So, so that is really the upshot of is, I'll talk more about that in a second, but just wanted to tell you that the radial distribution of short filaments point in the direction where the black hole is. Vertical filaments, on the other hand, do not have a radial direction going towards the black hole. They're basically going through the plane. They're, they're all over. There's no particular direction. They're enclosed within the bubble, but they're not necessarily pointing or converging towards a particular place. They're basically running into the plane of the galaxy. So that's actually a big difference between these two populations. But I'll talk about this a little bit more. Uh, so let's let me first talk about origin of long filaments and then I'll talk about or the origin of short filaments. But before I do that, let me pause for a second and see if you have any questions. Sure. So let's see if there are any questions from the in-person audience. And uh, then uh, there is also this question from online that uh, they want to know about, uh, do you have uh, the direction at which these filaments are moving? Uh, like are the perpendicular ones going up and down, let's say, or the parallel ones moving away from the center of the galaxy? Good, good question. Good question. We don't have the data. We we have to wait more 
a longer time to see the proper motion, the motion of these guys. Um, so that's that's one of the uh, one of the things that can be found in the you know I think it's I, I'd say maybe about uh, uh, five to ten years uh, we should be able to see some changes uh, at least for some of the ones that are fast moving fast. Okay, so far during the few decades that you've studied them, the, there there's no motion data, right? It's it's just remember this is about eight kiloparsecs, twenty five thousand light years away. So you really need a very, um, um, it, you have to wait in order to see the changes. These are not sub arc seconds or milli arc second resolution. It's, it's about an arc seconds. So you need to do more, uh, you need more time to search for it. Right. You Barbara. can place some upper uh, limit, but it's not very useful at this point. Yeah. Good question. Yeah. Yeah, uh, we do have one question here, Chris. Uh, thank you. It, the idea of these structures being radial for the short arcs to yeah. the galactic center, that would seem to have the consequence vis uh, visually on projected on the sky that short filaments that are off axis, meaning along the galactic equator, a Vela or Cygnus or someone like that would appear longer and ones in Sagittarius radial to the core, but we're looking straight down their length. They would be shorter visually on the sky. Is that what is observed? Well, let me, let me go ahead and, and I try to say exactly what we think is in terms of their line of sight with respect to us. Because all I'm showing you right now, radial, only assuming that it's on the plane of the sky, right? What you're asking is that, okay, so how do you know that it actually is tilted in such a way that it looks shorter, but it's actually longer, if I understand your question correctly. So as I, let me just, if you, wait a little bit more maybe becomes clear but if not please come back and just ask exactly what uh, uh, the, the 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 question that you have okay yeah. any other questions yeah i'm ready to uh, ready to go okay all right okay, so yes uh, all right so so um uh, let me just talk about origin of uh, the origin of long filaments. What do we think is happening um, as far as we know? So we know that the center of the galaxy is filled with high cosmic pressure. I mentioned that before, um, that the uh, there are multiple evidence that shows that the center of the galaxy has a very cosmic uh, uh, sort of uh, ionization rate, or you call it cosmic pressure, cosmic rate pressure, I'm sorry. Cosmic rate pressure is uh, 100 to 1,000 times more than in the disk of the galaxy. So one of the consequences of having a very high pressure in the plane of the galaxy is that it actually rips apart the field, magnetic field that is very, uh, has a very low pressure in this region, and it pushes it up in the direction away from the plane. You can think about it more like what we talked about clouds, that hot air basically just uh, gets elevated. It uh, rises because of buoyancy. Here is the pressure that is pushing the gas, or not the gas, the field, the weak field in the direction away from the plane. So in other words, it's a way for these cosmic pressure driving a wind. The wind that we see from the sun, for example, and creating um, or auroras, for example, you can also think about that way. That's that's a cosmic ray driven um, a wind, and this wind is almost like an outflow. So we think that uh, we've seen this kind of a outflow, cosmic ray driven winds in other galaxies as well. So it's theoretically is very well understood, at least as far as I can say. Um, and uh, so when you have such a high pressure, it just pushes things and channels uh, its pressure basically in the direction away from the plane. So, so that is a, a, a wind, is a stream of particles that are being pushed in the direction away from the plane. So then 
what happens is that as this wind is, is uh, uh, tra traveling away from the plane, it interacts with anything that comes across and it's a line of uh, sight. So it's almost, you know, an obstacle. And it could be an H2 region. It could be a star. It could be whatever. It just, uh, it, it just interacts with it. So this is what we have. We think that one of the models that we have for this origin of the filaments is that this cosmic ray driven wind is coming from the south, from the plane, and, and the magnetic field just gets wrapped around an obstacle and uh, similar to also cosmic, you know, the, the wind from the from our own sun wraps around the Earth's atmosphere in a sense. Um, and just as it gets the this obstacle, whatever it is, gets draped by the magnetic field, it just gets twisted. And as a result, you basically creating a very organized magnetic field, and and the particles basically gyrate along the magnetic field. So this is what we think is, is is so in other words the magnetic field is very weak when with you know where the wind is but then when it interacts with the with an obstacle the field just gets pushed and stretched and compressed as it gets compressed it basically the strength of the field increases so this is Similar to, let's say you have a rubber band, you know, you have a bungee cord, for example, if you push them against each other, basically the strength becomes larger as you wrap around, you know, if you, it's just like a spider web, you know, you move around the spider web, just to get, you get tangled, there's more of them all around you. So I think that's a model that is, um, is uh, proposed and now the, the, the million dollar question is that, what is this? So we are trying to find what this obstacle is. So if we can connect this obstacle to filaments, then this would be a good support for the, for the, for, for uh, we have some really good candidates. We've done some observations, unfortunately, it's very complicated, didn't really work out. So we have to rewrite a proposal and re, re redo these observations because of the, uh, complicated issue related to the galactic center. Uh, so that's one model. The, and, and But before I go, is that these simulations show that if you have a cloud, for example, and this is a MHD simulation, magnetohydrodynamic simulations, that the wind, as it interacts with the cloud, it creates a comet behind it, a cometary tail. And this cometary tail is eventually, as you see, the simulation as a function of time, eventually disappears and uh, get this... Um, uh, after a while, but this is sort of very uh, simple picture um, um, of a cloud being embedded by the uh, by by uh, a a um, a wind. Uh, so these things is not really unusual cometary tails behind an object. The other model is that the it's actually very different. The other model is related to something that is not causal. In other words. It says that these filaments are not really necessarily connected to any object, any particular object. It's related to the nature of the environment that they're in. The center of our galaxy is very turbulent medium, and there's a lot happening there. So if you steer something uh, rapidly, uh, you create a turbulence. The turbulence all of a sudden drives all these turbulent eddies and these eddies collide with each other. As they collide with each other, they have this always magnetic field is always there. So the magnetic field just gets wrapped around and around these eddies and they get folded and they, they basically get amplified and they get stretched and they get compressed. And the simulations show that after a while, you actually can create these these really beautiful structures that are very similar to some of the filamentary structures we're finding, multiple. So this is a transient effect, but it could be thousands and million years also for formation. So in other words, it's a dramatically different picture than what we've been thinking about all along, that it's it's the property of the, the medium, the turbulent medium that is creating these structures. Simulations show that, and it's all beautiful, but it's 
the tough thing is that how do you actually connect it to the actual observations? You see what I mean? So it's not, it's not, uh, so there has to be some predictions and I'm working with some people who are doing this kind of simulations that see what is the prediction on the, uh, the distribution of length, for example, the distribution of position angle, distribution of, so that's why those statistics all of a sudden become very important to apply to these ideas and test them. And the third uh, possibility is that these are all basically do supernova explosions. So this is the image that I showed you before. This is a nucleus of the galaxy. If there are lots and lots of supernova explosions, these explosions basically create these shock fronts and these shocks sometimes um, get merged together and uh, remarkably, these structures are showing up quite uh, very similar to what we find. This is the simulations that were done. Also, these supernova simulations that it's very similar to what we find in uh, in these uh, um, in the galactic center. So at this point, I think these are all looking very good. Uh, the only issue that I find is a little bit is that it's a bit contrived that you have all the supernova, you have to have lots and lots of supernova and they just have to have all explode more or less at the same time uh, in order to create all these structures. But maybe this this happened, maybe, you know, the the center of the galaxy was a starburst uh, galaxy and, and created these filamentary structures. So, uh, so these are really three major um, uh, ideas, and I'm obviously biased towards uh, the things that I like. There are lots and lots of other theoretical ideas, but uh, but they all sort of sound reasonable to me. Uh, and uh, oh, origin of short filaments. So, so this is the last section that I'm going to be talking about. I don't want to uh, really keep you um, uh, uh, long. Uh, so so I talk about origin of long filaments. Um, and now I'm going to be talking about origin, the origin of short filaments. Any questions? OK, let's see. Sorry. Our gravitational waves affecting the filaments. There was the movement around the gravitational waves. Yeah, one question we had here was whether gravitational waves are affecting the filaments. If there was a gravitational wave, it must have affected at some point. Um, but um, uh, but it's it's hard to know exactly what gravitational wave is going to do. It basically probably just uh, pushes them back, stretches them a little bit uh, on one side or another, but they have to be there to begin with. So we don't have a way to really test this idea, unfortunately, because it's already, if there was a gravitational wave, it's already detected. But the Galactic Center is also a good site for uh, for search for gravitational waves very close to the black hole also. So then uh, it would be interesting if somebody studies what that does um, to filaments. Okay, great. So let me, uh, let me go on to talk about the uh, origin of short filaments. As you recall, I mentioned that the short filaments are um, uh, distributed along the filaments uh, for, for the most part. And, uh, and we see it really on one side because the other side is really very complicated. It's hard to uh, bring out those structures. And I showed you, so what do we think is happening? So most of these structures that we're finding, they're radial, um, the short filaments radial and pointing towards um, towards the center of the galaxy, Psi J star. I don't uh, want to really show you the evidence for it, but pictorially you can see these radial directions, for example, some of them very nicely that is pointing in that direction. So, um, so what is that going to do? We think the idea that we have is that uh, the black hole at the center of the galaxy has an accretion disk and this spin axis must be in the direction along the plane. 
And it was inactive because of due to accretion onto the black hole, it ejected material and a conical axis um, into a sort of cones. One cone is blue shifted coming towards us and the other cone is red shifted. So why do you think that it's, we know that this part of the galaxy, the velocities are all highly, highly blue shifted towards us. And, and so the idea is that this is almost like a, a wind, but this is a powerful wind that is basically going through interacting with H2 regions, or even if there is a filament that is vertical, it just gets stretched and it gets bent because the pressure is sufficiently high that does that and clouds get accelerated. So we actually see a, a very prominent cloud called Sagittarius E cloud that you see the velocities are actually more blue shifted on this side than this side. So it is, um, it's, it's basically the idea is that the, the, uh, this, the pressure due to this outflow from the center of the galaxy is accelerating the cloud and it becomes more blue shifted. So we can figure out what kind of power you need to produce this. What is the mass outflow rate? It's about 10, one, 10,000 times of the mass of the sun per year. And it's been added for about the last uh, 6 million years. So this is the idea. Now, what we think is happening is that this blue shifted cone is about uh, 45 degrees in the direction towards us in order for, to explain the velocity structures and the blue shifted component. And, and what's really actually really, I'm very excited about this because several years ago, I had another paper that very close to Sag star, very close to the black hole. We saw all these features. You can see all these uh, features that all pointed in the direction that there must be an outflow. Well, we interpreted there must be an outflow blue shifted one side and red shifted on the other side. And this turns out to be actually the largest scale component of the same outflow we're talking about. This is very close to Sag A star within a few uh, to 10 parsecs. This is on the scale of 300 parsecs. So it's really exciting to see that at least if you put these data that is very confusing and some people didn't believe uh, because of the complications due to the black hole being very dominant and the motions are very complicated in that region. Um, but at least this actually provides some insight as to the nature of these other structures that oh, we found a few years ago. So, uh, so the bottom line is that stay tuned. This is very exciting. Um, Event Horizon Telescope eventually will find out what the spin axis of the, of the, uh, of the black hole is. And according to this idea, the data that we have is suggests that the spin of the black hole seems to be in the direction parallel to the galactic plane. And this is uh, the origin of, uh, re responsible for the origin of short filaments along the plane, but the ones that are further uh, vertical filaments are not necessarily related to the, uh, the black hole itself. It could be a byproduct of it. I don't have the time to go over it, but that I think is the distinction between the two populations of, of filamentary structures that we're finding. And it's actually giving us an insight about the activity that happened a few million years ago uh, by the black hole. And that, that is, I think it's quite exciting. Um, and, and I think I don't have the time to tell you about the population of filaments in other galaxies similar to what we find, um, but, um, but I, I'd like to just end by just giving you a summary of what um, we found uh, using Meerkat data. It's been really a fantastic uh, uh, data set for extracting lots of um, interesting details that we had not known before. And we are learning that there's, wind at the center of the galaxy, cosmic ray driven wind, and that may be actually responsible for creation of vertical filaments. And then for horizontal filaments, this is fairly new. We think it's also a different activity that happened a few million years ago. Um, and it's also possible, you know, I'm speculating now, black holes, sometimes they have, they change their orientations. 
so definitely this is all um, uh, sort of interesting, exciting, and uh, stay tuned to see if we can learn more about uh, the activities of the center of the galaxy uh, by looking at these uh, these structures. And and I want to thank you again to uh, stay around. <laughs> Hopefully you didn't waste your Friday night listening to me. Um, and uh, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Perfect. Thank you very much for such a great presentation and introducing us to yet another mystery of the universe. <laughs> and looking forward in the future years uh, for the new accomplishment in this regard. Oh, thank you. Oh, and uh, since you mentioned in your talk that you suggest that we member to go and visit these VLA if they happen to go to New Mexico, uh, let me use the opportunity to toot our own whistle. Uh, we also do have a program run by Doug Miller who uh, gets us yearly actually uh, to the uh, Ovens Valley Radio Observatory. Oh, uh, if yeah, people yeah. Uh, wants to want to take a look, uh, they do not have as many as 20 dishes, I believe, uh, but there's this huge 70 meter dish that uh, they, people can go and see in California. Yeah, 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 that's right. Yeah, California has their own. Ovens <laughs> <laughs> Valley was very, very actually popular at some point, uh, but then. Um, Alma came along in Chile. Mm. <laughs> so that's, right, right. Um. Good. Uh, so let me start by the questions. Uh, uh, you did mention this in your talk, but because uh, several people have asked this again, so just to set the record straight, can you tell us one more time what these filaments are made of? Yes, these filaments are, uh, first of all, magnetized. <clears throat> so the magnetic field runs along the filaments and they are uh, uh, the radiation that you see uh, uh, is produced by relativistic electrons that are gyrating around the magnetic field. As they gyrate, they, uh, they produce radiation. This is synchrotron radiation. And that is on a relativistic regime so it's almost, as I said, it's like, um, you know, the, the, the fireflies as they go around and they sort of uh, light, that's a chemical reason, but here electrons uh, basically emit radiation. Any, this is one of the physical principles of electromagnetic um, uh, theory is that if you accelerate a charged particle, it will radiate. And in this case, the acceleration is done um, and electrons are so light, so it's very easy for them to radiate. Uh, there are also protons there, but the protons are there, but they're not necessarily radiating as much. It's very insignificant compared to electrons. So that's, that's always you have electron protons together, basically, cosmic rays come together. Uh, they're not separated from each other because then you, you, you have <laughs> a charge, uh, uh, separation and that's not possible. So it's it's really very simple in a sense. It's just that how do you get these electrons to um, to get accelerated from very low energies to such high energies, and also how do you get the magnetic field to be so organized? And and there are lots of mysteries that why they all come together next to each other. For example, what is the origin of that? Is it, you know, so we talked about the origin of the filaments, uh, could be, you know, turbulence, it could be other. So it's, it's um, it may be actually a combination of some of the ideas that I talked about. So it may not be just one idea works for everything. Um, but but the beauty of this, all this is that I didn't get a chance to talk about this, but you do see filaments also in external galaxies. I cannot really help to show you this one. This is a radio galaxy at a, whatever, it's like a redshift of uh, close to uh, 0.1 or something. So this is a black hole and a jet coming out. That's what a typical radio galaxy does. Uh, the black hole basically emits, um, blows up basically material plasma uh, running along the jet on both sides. And then eventually they lose energy. They create these puffy uh, structures. So we know, you know, all radio galaxies have these kind of properties. 
But then recently, Meerkat has found these filaments. They are identical in many ways to what we see. There are only about maybe 10 or so that are found. Uh, they're weaker, but nobody knows exactly how the heck these things got created to begin with. Nobody had seen this before. So these filaments are, uh, the properties are very, very similar to the galactic center filament. So if I showed you this picture, you would have known, known the difference between them. These are galactic center filaments, the top, the three to your right, the three panels to your right. This is external galaxy. One is about 100, 200 kiloparsecs. The other ones are about tens of parsecs. So you can see that the scales are very different, but that is not the issue. The issue is length to width is the same. Links to it's perfect. And then since you're talking, we are on topic. There are uh, questions about uh, these extra galactic filaments. Where have they been found? Have they been found in Andromeda? Uh, no, no, no. This is very, very recent in the last few years. And uh, these are in radio. Remember, these are all synchrotron again. Mm -hmm. The magnetized uh, magnetic field runs along the skies. And, and you can see like similar to these, for example, these, uh, but why, uh, the, the surprise is that, why is it that it's showing up like this out of, and then there are other examples, I won't bother you. There's also another one here, and this is the galactic center one. And again, these are radio. So I think one of the, again, Meerkat has done this. This is all, nobody knows exactly how do you get a bridge between the two sides, this is understood perfectly fine. There's a black hole here, there's a jet. The jet is feeding basically, um, is being fed by the black hole uh, material because of the uh, accretion uh, rate is high there. But nobody knows how do you get these guys uh, creating a bridge between from one place to another. So, the, um, so what we think is that this is actually very similar to the galactic center but the nice things about it is that you already have a reason to eject material from the from the jet itself. Whereas the ones at the galactic center, they're a little bit even more mysterious because they're not even showing up. They don't really connect to anything that we just say, oh, you know, they get they're being fed by something. So, but but their properties are very similar. Very all the properties are different, uh, similar to each other. So the mystery is interesting. It's one step better because you know all these years people always ask me where where else can you find these things? Because you know a lot of people are not interested in the center of the galaxy. They're looking at other galaxies. I I don't know. I said, well, we can't really find these things. You know, we haven't been able to. They're too weak or something. But then Meerkat came along and found these structures. So they're about. Uh, less than a dozen of these sources are showing up now. So it's mm -hmm. certainly that by itself is a very interesting, interesting angle to study. And hopefully each of these different population, galactic versus extra galactic populations, tell us something interesting in the future. Hopefully we can get more insights as to what the origin of these guys are. Thank you. Okay, let's go to the Chapman University. Any questions there? Um, the, the question was, can magnetars make filaments or are they too small? People have, have uh, come up with pulsars as a way to produce these filamentary structures. Um, the, the thing is that we see so many of these filamentary structures, as I said, thousand of them. Uh, it's just very difficult to really have thousand magnetars or thousand pulsars to create these structures. It's just it's, it's just not possible to have that many pulsars in in a relatively small volume of the of the center of the galaxy. So I think that's 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 the challenge. That's how do you do that? But pulsars could be a very interesting uh source of acceleration because they can they can provide lots of really relativistic particles and um but they need something else also so yeah 
Any other questions? I'm not seeing any other hands here. Thank you very okay. much. Sure. Let's have uh, a question from the uh, online people. Um, so you categorize these filaments two ways. First of all, by their lengths and then the angle that they make uh, with the right. galactic plane. So, uh, and if I uh, understood correctly, the longer filaments are the ones that are, uh, well, the, you mentioned the position uh, being zero, it means they're uh, vertical. Right. Right. So uh, here's the question. Could the vertical filaments be longer um, due to less material interaction that the short filaments have to deal with within the galactic plane? Yeah, yeah, that's a good point because the galactic plane is a, is constantly rotating. So, uh, so the 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 this sort of the rotation is basically doesn't allow the very long filaments to last for for a long time. So, I'm sure there may be there are some. In fact, there are some really parallel filaments, and they're relatively long, but they're few of them. And and I think it's um, it's it's quite possible that you do have also parallel filaments, um, but they just got got distorted over over the sort of the um, the last several million years because of the rotation period of the of, of you know of, of the galaxy, the inner galaxy. So it just limits. Uh, so maybe that we do see even uh, you know. They have their spectrum is also very different, but but yeah, I think that may be part of uh, the problem. Also, it's easier to uh, have them in the direction of least resistance away from the plane. And uh, thank you. The the next question uh, wants to a, a little bit more elaboration on the Fermi bubble that you showed. Uh, and yes. the point that you make was that that they are the same as those at the galactic center, or can you elaborate more on that, please? Well, this was more of a demonstration that you find this uh, unique structure at the center of the galaxy, and uh, and you don't find it elsewhere because it's pointing towards uh, the direction of uh, you know, the the black hole. So the idea is that a black hole uh, had a powerful, powerful outburst uh, several million years ago, and you see this in gamma rays. Uh, there is also another idea is that this uh, gamma ray uh, bubble is also created by uh, supernovae uh, all at the same time created this, uh, this energetic event. Again, I think it's contrived, but I think more people think that it's actually the black hole is really creating this, this event. Um, so there are lots of really models and there are lots and lots of work has been done also on the nature of these, uh, these structures. So it looks like really our black hole has been quite active, even though it's dormant right now, uh, but over the last uh, uh, sort of 10 uh, million years or so, there multiple events pointing to uh, the accretion onto it. So if the accretion goes high, all of a sudden you get you get an outburst. It has to eject some of its material out, and that's what we see, the structures um, that we find. It's just the difficulty is that, you know, how to separate them at different times. So there is also the radio bubble that I showed you earlier. I didn't talk about it that much, but the radio bubble is actually sitting within the gamma ray bubble. It's much smaller scale. Uh, it's only about a thousand light years. Um, uh, so, so it's as if there is another event that happened also after the gamma ray bubble. Gamma ray bubble is much, much more energetic. It's really just a tremendous, tremendous activity that happened um, uh, 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 10 million years ago. Okay, thank you. And in your talk, you did uh, well. Uh, we know uh, the visual observers get annoyed with all these extra satellites that are yeah. being put visually, but you also mentioned radio observatories are being bothered with that. So, can you tell us a little bit about the kind of radio frequency interference uh, the, this Meerkat telescopes are getting uh, in South Africa? Yes, they are. Uh, so, the, the, 
the problem is yes the satellites are all producing radio radio signals and interfering and in fact uh, having 64 antennas um, uh, you get about about 50% of data is basically uh, washed out. But there are all kinds of algorithms have been created and uh, uh, array of radio telescopes have an advantage that optical folks uh, don't. And that is because you have array of telescopes spread out over certain distances. So the satellites basically uh, creates these signals and these signals in order to corrupt completely the data that you're getting from the sky has to correlate with all the antennas. But the fact that there is distance between them and if it reaches basically one and not the other, the, there is a way that you know, the signals have to be correlated and everything that is not correlated just gets thrown out. That is one of the advantages of having a, so, so even though 50%, 50% of the ones that are very close uh, baselines, uh, usually 50% of data just gets removed. Uh, but the sh longer baselines are in a better shape because you can recover um, a good percent of it. So it's only get corrupted by maybe 30% or so at certain frequencies, obviously. And then some frequencies are a little bit uh, cleaner but yeah, I mean that's that's a real world. It's a it's it's you always have to fight uh, with this. It's not anymore, you know. Anywhere you have your telescope, you're gonna have these these signals coming in um, constantly. And uh, and I know one of uh, one of the lines of uh, OH molecules. OH molecule has four transitions, hyperfund transitions, and one of the transitions I think it's sixteen sixty five or sixteen sixty two megahertz and that is completely washed out in uh, in europe they can't really observe it because of uh, these european satellites have completely just uh, uh, destroyed it so yeah there are you know certainly uh, it's 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 not the, the sky radio sky is not as clean as it used to be um, and the only place really that is clean is uh, green bank because they have a certain uh, rules that you cannot really interfere with, uh, uh, with, with radio signals in that part of the country. So it's really the band is protected only one, one region and one place in the US, the entire US, and that is in Green Bank, West Virginia. Um, but all other telescopes suffer from, especially as you go to lower and lower frequencies. I just had an experiment done at a wavelength of, um, 74 megahertz. Uh, this is about four meters. I really wanted to study the same region we talked about at very low frequencies. There are some really nice science you can do at low frequencies, but it got completely washed out. Completely, completely. I had eight hours oh. and proposals and, and so just uh, it's all RFI, radio interference. So it That's is it certainly, it certainly is, a, is an issue also for radio folks. Okay, thank you. Let's see uh, if there are any uh, Chapman questions. A question just showed up. Yeah, this is Doug uh, K6JEY. We've been up the Owens Valley Radio Observatory a bunch of times, and the new two DSA telescopes should help you out. They're going down to 700 megahertz and up to about two, uh, and that's difficult because there are some pretty like the the uh, gps system is in the middle of that band yeah when you get lower there's a low frequency the lfa array up at owens valley radio observatory and we've had uh some struggles trying to clear the spectrum out of stuff that wasn't supposed to be there um some of it was that there wasn't any filtering in the front end of the of the receivers but there's a an fm station in Lone Pine, 100 miles away, and it comes in loud and clear in the telescope because it's, it's a survey telescope that goes from horizon yeah, to horizon. Right, 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 right. Yeah. So, no, I, I, I know what you're going through. It's difficult as you go to lower frequencies. Um, and, uh, but sometimes I think, you know, if you maybe observing at different times, maybe things get better. Um, 
you have what about mobile um, yeah when, when we were up there a long time ago we used the 40 meter dish to bounce radio signals off the moon and had a kilowatt transmitter hooked up to oh, it. really yeah and wow. that was fun we got <laughs> we got some really nice communications but then uh that's basically a receiving site and the only time anybody used a transmitter so we haven't done much since then right there is one i think uh, didn't know that you were actually interested in this but let me see if i can find uh one one plot that may be uh of interest to you folks if i still have it this is a rfi distribution in uh at meerkat so that you okay. can get a sense of what kind of interference you are uh, Wait, you're you're this, talking about the the whole FM band, all of the the VHF communication, wireless microphones, yeah, yeah, pacemakers, yeah. just about everything. Yeah, that's right. That's, okay. Yeah. That's, so you can see this. I don't know if you can see this image. Uh, MRSAT and the GPS L3. Yeah. So this is yeah. Uh, I have to get rid of this. Well, they're putting the DSA 2000 telescope a hundred miles east of Tonopah, Nevada, where there's not even any running water. So, oh. and then and the mountains are another five thousand feet higher than the valley, so they think they'll get quite a good blockage out there. But the problem is that down in the lower part of the spectrum, between nine hundred and twelve hundred megahertz, there there is some terrestrial stuff that gets propagated off the ionosphere that'll drop into the valley, oh. and and the 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 frequencies from nine hundred to fifteen hundred megahertz basically L band or great radar. Uh, 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 frequencies and the signals bounce off of everything so you could get a terrestrial signal bouncing up through the valley from los angeles uh -huh. and not being able to do anything and then of course there's the the uh, military radar at 1200 megahertz so yeah, it's, right. it's very interesting right. to kind of keep the lid on the interference problems yeah right yeah there is a, a very um the national science foundation has a radio group uh, that they meet all the time, and they are protecting basically uh, radio bands, yeah. and uh, they're very active. They they deal with uh, commercial companies and and also radio observatories, and uh, so if you, in case you have some issues and you really want to want them to hear, uh, uh, you may want to contact them at the National Radio Astronomy Observatory has one representative. But this is a fairly serious um, uh, meeting, the serious uh, uh, a group of people who meet all the time to protect basically the uh, yep. the radio band. Uh, There's so. a, a big meeting going on in Europe about the GOES system. But I'll say one thing about that we do in ham radio and what they do in astronomy. Okay, let me just finish this one thought. We put a fence around the edge of the antenna to, to not catch anything from the from the ground, but also not to spill over. And we take the feed at the feed point and shield it so nothing comes in sideways, which is a case if you have a, an exposed radiator. And that seems to, to make your beam just go straight out and not hear a lot of Oh, other. yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's helpful. It's very okay. old-fashioned ideas that they used to have. You yes. protect you look at the the way cosmic microwave background was discovered. So oh, we're down in frequencies where you have to do that. Okay, yeah. I'm done. Okay. <laughs> when radio astronomers get together. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, any other questions here? No. I think I, um, we don't have any further ones here. So if you've got any other ones. Okay, online. perfect. So uh, you're also running quite late. Uh, let me ask the last uh, question from online audience. Um, is there any relation of these observations to Eric Lerner's theories of galaxy dynamics? Uh, was the question clear or was I? Uh... Well, 
Raisa, I don't know if he could hear you. Oh, okay. Uh, can I be heard right now? Uh, uh, Farhad, do you have our voice? Yeah, I do. I do. Uh, okay. So, um, yeah, I'm amazed. Still, people are are sticking around. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, there is this last question that we want to end with. And uh, they were asking about if there are any relations of these observations to uh, Eric Lerner's theories of galaxy dynamics. I honestly have to say I don't know. Uh, I don't think it should be any uh, relevant to the galactic dynamics. These are just a very small, you know, it's an environmental effect. It's not telling us, uh, these things don't tell us anything about the galactic dynamics. We're not really looking at the motion of stars. These are structures that are found in uh, the you know, in, in a, a very unusual environment. So that's really all uh, I can say. I don't know much about the, the theory of it. Yeah. Perfect. So let me thank you very much, uh, Farhad, for joining us and giving us this uh, wonderful presentation and uh, educating us about these new no, mysteries. No, no. Thank you very much for inviting me. It's uh, wonderful to see all these uh, great questions that you ask. I hope you got something out of this. Um, and if you have any questions, let me know. I'd be happy to answer. Uh, wonderful to uh, spend time with you. And uh, and you take care. and Keep up the interest in blue sky. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you very much. Let me also thank all the people uh, in attendance at Chapman and also online. Uh, please check the calendar on our website for our, our upcoming events at ocastronomers.org. Uh, Barbara, are there any final points you would like to make? No. <clears throat> Sorry, this microphone seems to be uh, temperamental. Um, I know I, I don't think so, but uh, thank you, Professor. We really do appreciate the, uh, the great talk and learning a new mystery in our galaxy. <laughs> well, I didn't. <laughs> let me finish with the last uh, thing that I, I wanted to say. Uh, but I didn't get a chance to show you uh, this. This may actually be very uh, relevant as a closing point to the to my presentation, and that is is this is exactly the point that we were talking about. Um, can you see this? Yes. Okay. So I it's think I can see. It's uh, you shouldn't be bothered so much about mysteries. Mysteries are always interesting. I find that we live in a mysterious world, and that's why we have this sort of a awe moments in our lives. And the more mystery, the better it is. And these awe moments, I think, affects also physiologically how we feel and how we connect uh, to each other. And I think Einstein really said it best. And uh, so. Uh, but we're going to try to uncover <laughs> these mysteries, <laughs> learn more about them. But I think the fact that they're there is quite um, interesting all by itself. What a great note to end this meeting on. Thank you, everybody, right, for okay. joining us. Have a and good great times ahead.